car shows, they finish the car and it's always perfect. Everything works fantastically well. Well, that, that never happens either. Uh-oh, doesn't look good. Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Well, it's finally finished. This is my 1962 Daimler SP250. Now, when this car was originally developed, it was called the Daimler Dart. But uh, when they brought it to America, Chrysler, of course, uh, had the name Dart, and they filed a petition, so they quickly changed it to SP250, which stands for sports car, and 250, of course, 2.5 liter. It took us a couple of years to finish this car. You know, I love watching these shows where people build a car in like 10 days. Larry, you do this. Billy, you do the wheels. Come on, guys, let's do it. And the whole car is done. No, it takes a long time. It takes a long time to finish. And this car has been not, I wouldn't use the term resto modded, but let's say tastefully updated. Uh, improved brakes, improved carburation. Um, this is the rare hardtop model with the wire wheels. You know, I got this car from a guy named William Bozowski. I hope I'm saying his name right. Um, his uncle bought it new. It was willed to him. The car was left outside for something like 40 years. It was pretty rough shape. It didn't run when I got it. I'll show you some of the restoration blogs in, in just a minute. Now, this car had the distinction of being voted the ugliest car at the 1959 auto show in New York City. And it takes some getting used to. We'll take the roof off later and we take it for a ride. True, it was not the most impressive looking car, but there was something something under this hood that came from the factory that made it very cool. And here it is. That's right, it's a Hemi engine, but it's not made by Chrysler. It's made by Daimler. It's 2.5 liter, and it is just a little jewel of a motor. Here's a cutaway of the motor outside the engine, and you can tell by the dimensions just how compact it is. Let's take a look at the restoration blog. You know, the first rule of restoring something is don't start a new project until your old project is finished. Well, it, that doesn't apply. As you can see, the engine compartment's pretty rough, but it's all there. It's a fiberglass car, so it doesn't rust. I believe this was designed by Edward Turner, you know, the famous Triumph guy. As you can see, the interior, the leather's all dried and cracked, but that can be fixed, it's all there. The gauges, surprisingly, look at the gauges. Uh, the gauges look good, probably need to be cleaned up mechanically, but the faces are all nice. It's a big project, well, not a giant project. Hey, come on over, let me show you where the body is at. Oh, she's still got a bit more sanding to do, uh, but uh, this is all the paint and prep work. The chassis's all been painted and straightened. Uh, front end is going on, brakes are going on. We had some axle problems. We tried to get new axles for these, but we couldn't find anybody. These splines were all pretty chewed up, but Bernard's done a good job of fixing them. As you can see, the fiberglass is cleaning up very nicely. All the, the crazing and cracks have been taken care of. I love this color blue. We disassembled the motor, cleaned it up, and reassembly will start very soon. Come on over here. We're here in the engine assembly room. Uh, as you can see, the valve covers have cleaned up very nicely. They're aluminum. I love Hemi heads. They look great. Hemi valve covers are my favorite. The pan has... Uh, Cleaned up very nicely. Sandblasted that. We did that. Oil filter. Everything is uh, everything has been disassembled. Every nut and bolt has been taken off of this car. Let me show you. Uh, let me show you the body. The body's coming together really good. Here is the uh, fiberglass body. Well, you saw it before. <laughs> it looked pretty rough. Nice thing about fiberglass, obviously, it doesn't rust. Heater box is in there, fuel filter, brake master cylinder. We're slowly getting it, uh, getting it together. It's coming along good. Our Dynamat is in. Uh, this Dynamat stuff is, is fantastic. It really does work as an excellent sound deadening material, and it keeps all the heat in the engine bay instead of coming into the compartment. We use that in everything we do. But as you can see, the body has turned out nice. Being a fiberglass car, obviously, it didn't rot. Yeah little build plate right here. We got our windshield frame on. We got a few chrome pieces on. Bumpers are looking nice. Come on, let's show you the chassis. Show you what we've got over here. Here's where we're going to cheat just a little bit. Uh, we're going to put this Tremec uh, five-speed in. 
You know, Tremec gearboxes are unbelievable. It, 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 this is the greatest boon to the old car hobby because you can put them behind anything. XKEs, Corvettes, Jaguars. This is meant to run five or 600 horsepower. And this, this car will be about uh, 200 horsepower, something like that. So it'll be totally unstressed. We were going to put the original gearbox in in an overdrive unit, and we still have that on the shelf, and we can go back to that at any time. But we just like the Tremec products because they're, uh, uh, they last forever, every single part is available, and they never break. So here it is right here, and it's, uh, it's a pretty light unit. You can do you a little bit of workout with this. And that's the chassis. As you see, brakes are on, front end is on. We've done a little bit of bracing in here. This is a pretty rare piece. This is the hard top that fits on this car. This car left the factory with the hard top on it. That's kind of exciting. These cars are rare enough already, and to have the hard top, that makes it uh, an extra rare piece. So, Well, here's the engine over here. Actually, it's in pretty good shape. Like, it's almost finished, as you can see. Uh, interior's done, uh, the engine's done, new steering rack. We'll be road testing this car very, very soon. Well, as you saw on the restoration blog, this has an honest-to-goodness Hemi engine. Uh, designed by Edward Turner from, of course, the man who did the motorcycles for uh, Triumph, the Speed Twin, uh, Triumph Bonneville, and there's a lot of motorcycle practice used in this engine. Here, let me open the hood here. You know, it's fascinating. Everybody went crazy for the Sunbeam Tiger with the 260 V8. Whereas this, this was really Britain's first V8 sports car. And this is a beautiful engine. This thing revs to just about uh, pretty close to six grand. Made 140 horsepower in stock form. This one's probably closer to 200. We did away with the dual Solex carburetors, put this Weber on it. Mike Pierce at Pierce Manifold, he did a great job modifying the intake there so we could get the Weber carburetor on there. We changed the steering rack. It had the old worm gear kind of steering, which is a bit heavy. And we put a steering rack out of a uh, Triumph Spitfire. We upgraded the brakes from uh, Moss Motors. Well, they're really the leaders in British sports cars, parts and things, MG, Triumph, all that kind of stuff. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Daimler. Daimler is an old English company. Uh, Daimler, of course, was German. I think a man named Sims bought the rights to produce the Daimler car in England and from about 1900. It was an English automobile, still is. Um, it was sort of the car of kings, the, the royal family used them until I think 1950, when uh, I think the king was in the car and the transmission went out and they said, that's it. And I think they switched to Rolls Royce after that. So Daimler was kind of on their own. This is the first sports car they ever built. And in terms of performance, it, they, they really hit it out of the park. It just wasn't the prettiest car. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of the problem with it. The idea was they wanted to make something the Americans would like. So it's got proper fins. They put some fins on it. In fact, here's what the car looked like before it was toned down. Take a look at this picture. Interesting bit of trivia about these cars. Being one of the fastest sports cars of the day, certainly as fast as the Jaguar 150, and right up there, I think, with the Corvette, too was the fact that the London Metropolitan Police ordered 30 of these in black with automatic transmissions because they wanted cars that could catch motorcyclists. You know, uh, the mods and the rockers and all that was going on at the time, and the ton-up boys, you know, the guys who would race 100 miles an hour from one cafe to another in that sort of romantic period of the Ace Cafe when they'd start a record and you had to go 100 miles an hour in a big loop and could be back to the cafe before the record ended. Well, this was the only car that could catch those guys. And every now and then you see one of those uh, for sale. Probably one of the better books on the Daimler sports car. There's been a couple over the years. This is the most recent one. Daimler V8 by Brian Long. Got a lot of great uh, pictures, factory pictures, stories, things of that nature. Even all the original ads of the day. And it really tells the story of why the car was not as successful as it should have been. Because it really is a fantastic motor, easy to work on. Uh, beautifully balanced, very fast, not, not much maintenance involved. But anyway, this is, I want to thank Brian for writing. You know, you don't make a lot of money writing these books. They only built 2,648 of these cars, and that's about how many, how many books you sell on it, maybe a few more. So I, I want to thank him for doing that. But as you can see, all types of great pictures. You can get this I mean, at auto books or just about any place online. So I just want to give them a free plug. I think it's pretty good. Now, this is a 1962. When the car came out in 59 and 60, 
Uh, it was up for a lot of criticism, a lot of chassis flex. In fact, the chassis flex so much, we go around corners, the doors would pop open. <laughs> yeah, always a problem. <laughs> doors pop open, we go around corners. But they weren't quite finished yet. Then what happened was Jaguar bought Daimler. And uh, they had the XKE, so they weren't too worried about this. But this engine was so potent, uh, it was a bit of a threat to them, I think. Uh, Sir William Lyons just couldn't believe how bad the quality was in these cars when they were built originally. So the, the next series, the B series, was updated quite a bit. Chassis was made a lot stronger. Um, everything was sort of improved. And then there was a C series, that was the last series by 1964, which had a cigarette lighter and a heater defroster and a few other things like that. I think this is somewhere between a B and a C. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But, you know, Jaguar put uh, better bumpers on it. The car was originally based on the Triumph TR3. The frame was very similar to the Triumph TR3. But the real gem was this engine mounted to a four-speed transmission with an overdrive. Um, as you saw in the video, we put the Tremec in this. And boy, what a difference that makes. But uh, they only built 2,648 of these, 1,200 were maybe exported to the United States. It just didn't catch on because compared to Corvettes and Thunderbirds and even Triumphs and MGs, it just wasn't that good looking a car, but boy, it was faster than most of them. This was as fast as the XKE. I mean, stock in 59, I think these hit about 124 miles an hour. We breathed on the engine a little bit and changed the carburetion to a Weber. Uh, these always were great sounding engines. You'll hear that in, in just a minute. But when, when you drive it, you have to take this top off, which we will in a second. I'm hoping that uh, Bobby can come out, the gentleman I got this from, and then go for a ride with me in it and drive the car. I think he'd really get a kick out of it. We've been in touch over the last three, four years because we, we wrote a piece about it for Popular Mechanics. So you can Google and read about that. And you can see in the restoration blogs. Uh, I'm so glad he sold it to me. You know, it, it's crazy to buy a car you've never seen, but sometimes you can tell. They're just guys that like automobiles and want their car to go to a good home. And I probably only burned once buying sight unseen cars. Not that I would recommend you to do that, but I could tell from the pictures it was all there. It had never been hit. I think there was one bit of damage. We had to straighten the chassis just a little bit in the back, but the fiberglass doesn't appear to ever have been damaged. And it was all there. Take a look at the trunk, or the boot, as they say. That's a pretty good size. Here's our tonneau cover. Let's take the roof off, put the tonneau cover on, and we'll go for a ride. Well, as you can see, we've got the roof off. We've got our tonneau cover on. Uh, I'm not sure what a tonneau is. Are we covering a tonneau? I'm not sure what it even means, but it's called a tonneau cover. Okay, let's start it up. Great sounding engine. Don't forget, this is 1959. You know, this engine could have been Britain's answer to the uh, 283 Chevy or the 289 Ford. You know, they, they went and took our Buick engine, you know, that 215 aluminum engine, uh, and they used it in everything. Well, I don't know why they didn't go with this. It was, it was made over there, it was designed by a British guy. It's just a fantastic motor. So let's, uh, let's take it for a spin. Let's do a quick, uh, obviously, horn. You have tachometer here, speedometer here. Pretty simple, fuel, water, oil, volts. Let's go for a ride. The cool thing about this is, this really is the first drive. We literally just finished the car, so it's, it's pretty exciting. Everything seems pretty tight. Let's take it for a spin. Oh my god, you, you know, this Tremec box, oh, it really is fantastic. Now, the original car would have had a four-speed with an overdrive, which is actually like a five-speed. So this Tremec five-speed is certainly in the spirit of the car, and it's just so much better. You know, as I said in the restoration blog, this transmission can take five, six, seven hundred horsepower. So the close to 200 of this thing, it'll never break. And it sounds fantastic! Ah! You know, I really think this period, late 50s, mid 60s, this was the golden age of sports cars, certainly British sports cars. I mean, they were reasonably priced, they were fun to drive, they handled, they were lightweight. This car only weighs 2,200 pounds, which is pretty amazing. So close to 180, maybe 200 horsepower, pushing 2,200 pounds. I think they're pretty lively. It does look like a catfish, doesn't it? Just kind of 
on a bottom feeder going along scooping up stuff. There was nothing in the period that could go like this car. Jag was about as close as you could get. And don't forget, it had roll-up windows, heater, defroster, hard top. Uh, you know, a lot of things weren't available to the Triumphs and the MG. Using our uh, 3D printer, we are able to make a, a bell housing to adapt the, uh, adopt the Tremec to this, uh, this engine. I think we're probably the only people that I know of that have adopted a Tremec transmission in this engine, so maybe somebody will make an adapter. And of course, California is perfect for this car. 70 degrees, top down, up. And this two-barrel Weber works perfectly on this car. You don't want to over-carburate it. You know, the Sunbeam Tiger seemed like such a revolutionary idea. Oh, let's put a V8 in a little bit of sports car. What is this? Daimler have been doing this since 1959 with their own V8. Yet for some reason, these cars go largely unnoticed. Uh, even car enthusiasts go, look at the cars I it. They want to know all about it, and they find it fascinating. So the engine is relatively quiet. The exhaust is as noisier as you want to make it, certainly. But, you know, no top-end noise, none of that. And it's a classic American-style V8, except it's small, 2.5 liter. I think this was the last great engine Edward Turner did. He uh, later did some motorcycle engines in the 60s for BSA, and it didn't quite work. So I think this is his last great, great motor. Quite pleased the engine is running nice and cool. You know, it's fun to take an engine that hadn't run in 40 years or so and just put it back together and clean it up. It shows you that cars can have shelf lives of 70 or 80 years if you if you take care of them. And I'm really only the second owner. I mean, it's been in the same family all those years, and then I got it from Bobby. So, Bobby, thanks again. I'm just watching the temperature gauge, and the nice thing is the, the more I rev it, the more I put my foot into it, the cooler it runs. When I sit at a light, I notice the temperature creeps up a little bit. But once I get on it, and I start making some power, the water's moving quickly and it cools the motor nicely so that's that's good to know everything is working properly and uh what have we got here at 3000 rpm in third gear i've got just about 55 pounds of oil pressure that's fantastic looks good you know i keep reading about modern cars that have fake engine noise piped in through the stereo and all that kind of stuff and i i guess that's okay i guess that's progress but I just like the visceral authenticity of this car. As you can hear, brakes a little squeaky. Got to fix that. But now we got on a road where this car can really breathe. This sounds like a big American V8, doesn't it? <laughs> Imagine this car weighs about the same as McLaren F1. Plus McLaren F1 has 627 horsepower. But about the same way. Boy, I, I gotta say it handles very nicely. Just keeping my eye on all the gauges because this is, as I said, the very first run in the car, so.
as you can see, we seem to be running a little bit hot. My gauge is pinned right here at 230. Take a look. Um, I'm going to let it cool off for a minute here and see what happens. But that's all that happens on the first run. It's not bad. It's a little warm. Let's let it cool off. Okay, it's not rumbling. It's just hot. So, we got water coming out? Let me start it up again then. Better let it circulate. Like many things over 50 or 60, they leak. It's interesting, I, I, I remarked just a little while ago when I increased throttle, temperature went down. So I'm sure we started with enough water. I'm gonna go back and see, maybe the thermostat is stuck or maybe uh, just gotta go with a lower thermostat, but that's not too bad. Come on, let's take it, we'll take it back home and we'll uh, see if she cools off on the freeway. If it was oil pressure, I'd be really worried, but uh, it's a hot day today in California and the engine's fairly new, so um, we'll see what happens. Let's bring it back to the shop, we'll take a look. I'm gonna coast down and let it cool off. Hang on. much. Will we make it back to the shop? I don't know. Let's find out. Engine doesn't feel tight. It's not making a lot of noise. So Let's see if she cools down. If I have got about 2400 RPM at 60. Got some air flowing through there. See if it cools it a little bit. Well, that's what you do on test drive. You test the car to see if everything's all right. And uh, everything seems fine except we're just running hot. I'm gonna put it neutral and coast down this hill, see if it drops the temperature. Engine's running fine. It would have stalled if it was really hot. Maybe our pressure is the gauge, I don't know. We did see a little steam coming out the bottom, but this long downhill run should cool it. This is what makes uh, test runs exciting. You never know what's gonna happen. See a modern car, ah, you get home all the time. This, this is an adventure. That doesn't sound too bad. Let's uh, open the hood and see what we got. Okay. Maybe a fan is not running, let's see. Okay, here's our problem. It was fairly simple, and we didn't do any damage. This is a pressurized radiator cap. When you have a pressurized radiator cap, obviously it increases the pressure. So you can run 220, 230. Corvettes run that hot all the time, and the water circulates fine. The problem is, I'll show you, the cap is fine, but the neck is an inch deep. This cap goes down 19 millimeters. 19 millimeters. This is 25. So consequently, even when you did this, the cap was never sealing, so it was like riding without a radiator cap. It was just sitting on there. When the water got hot, under pressure, of course, it would, ex it would circulate, but with no pressure from the cap, it just pssst, came out as steam, and we lost all our water. So our problem is we'll put new coolant in, we'll get a brand new radiator cap, we'll measure the depth, we'll get one that really seals, and we'll be fine. So, Hey, I think we learned something. Hopefully maybe you learned something too, you know. You just don't go by and down and buy a radiator cap and stick it on because you want to take your car for a ride. You measure it and you find out the right cap and the right pressure for the vehicle that you have. And uh, I learned something. Maybe you learned something too. So <laughs> we'll see you guys next week. Thanks. Mm-hmm. <laughs>